Inspiring women among us, Joel McKiernan, one of our regular social work instructors, will be giving another presentation two weeks from now. But um, I'll just ask Amy Klepitar to tell us uh, briefly about this, uh, this program. Amy has been leading the charge when it comes to uh, the Inspiring Women Among Us for, for our campus and local activities here. Amy. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. And thanks, Dina, for graciously allowing your talk to be part of this uh, series of events. So Inspiring Women Among Us. It's an annual celebration. It's a series of events that lead up to December 6th, which is the anniversary of um, the event when um, female university students were murdered in Quebec in 1989. And so a lot of universities across Canada um, create events sort of uh, promoting women in academia and promoting women getting edu education. And UNBC in all three sites, or all four sites, has also um, joined in this. So we have a, a few events that originate from this campus, including Dana's talk at Joelle's. We also have a film on November 24th in the evening called She's Beautiful When She's Angry. <coughs> um, and then there are a few events that are at the Prince George campus that we've um, agreed to have live, live streamed here. So on Monday, November 21st, we have a eco-feminism talk and a panel discussion that is about indigenous women land stewards. And we had Winona LaDuke scheduled to join in that panel, but unfortunately she had to reschedule. So those events will come, but later in the, in the academic year. Um, and so I also wanted to let you know we have t-shirts available for sale here. Um, it, all proceeds from the t-shirt sales go to a scholarship fund that helps women struggling <coughs> with barriers to getting a university education. So if you're interested in purchasing a t-shirt, it does say you're a feminist on the back of it, so I have to give you a warning. Um, a northern feminist. Northern feminist. <laughs> very specific northern feminist. But they come in men's and women's sizing, just so you know. Um, and you can contact me directly if you're interested. Thanks. And thanks, guys, for having us. So by way of introduction, most of you probably uh, know Dina. She's originally from Vancouver, did her bachelor's degree in political science, I found out, from the University of Victoria. She's been um, up here teaching at Northwest Community College since about 1993, is that what you told me? Yeah, across a wide range of studies, English, history, women's studies, and, and, uh, and, and others. Um, and uh, she uh, recently, I guess it's not so recently anymore, got her master's uh, from California State University and is going to talk to us on a topic today that both blends those disciplines and of course is topically appropriate for this month. Mm -hmm. Take it away, Dina. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, um, so I know many of you already um, know my name, Dina Von Hahn. I uh, just got a bit of my bio and, and Phil stole my thunder there. I was going to say, I got asked to speak this month because it's Women's History Month and I thought, okay, how can I just combine all the different disciplines that I teach in? And I came up with this title, The Politics of Women's History in Canada. So I'm, I will, it's a general overview. So this is a very general talk. I'm not presenting detailed original research. I'm just giving a bit of an overview of the disciplines that I teach in, how they connect to each other, and then a little bit of a focus on Women's History Month in Canada and how that might be political. So uh, here I am, you know, I'm at the Persons Monument in Ottawa where the famous five, there are statues of the famous five women who took their case to the, the Privy Council in England because the highest court in Canada at that time had ruled that they were not legal persons and that therefore women could not sit on the Canadian Senate. So those women took their case to the Privy Council and they won. And from that time forward, Canada, women in Canada legally became persons. So that's a part of the reason that we have in Canada October as Women's History Month because it was on October 18th, 1929 that that decision came down that made women legal persons. So, so what was the thing? Hmm? What was the year of it? 1929. Hi, Char. Oh, hi, Char. Hello. Um, so I will start by talking a, a little bit about the various disciplines that I am teaching in. So the first discipline that I have just begun teaching in fairly recently is history. So the disciplinary lens of history is that of telling stories. So we're essentially asking the question, what happened? And stories obviously happen on many levels. So personal stories 
So I feel a bit like an imposter up here talking about women's history because you all have personal stories that are part of the history of women in Canada, many of which are go way, you know, way, way back longer than mine or anything that I might. And you all have expertise in the history of women in Canada that I don't have. So I'm sure, like think now, just take a minute and think of someone in your life that, that you think of. When you think of history of women in Canada, do you have an individual in your life or maybe yourself that you think about? So just take a minute and think about I would ask you to share, but there's so many here. So did I, can anyone think of somebody? Did everyone come up with a person or persons or yourself, maybe, that reflects the history of women in Canada? Yeah, I'm sure you did, and that would be a unique niche. Then we also have social stories. So, oh, just jumping back a bit. Personal stories in history would be biography. And when we think of history of women, we often think of biography. We often think of key figures and individuals like the famous five that I just talked about. Then we also have social stories. So all of you probably identify with a particular group. So it might be a, a professional group. It might be an ethnic group. It might be um, as women. It might be any number of group or groups. And those groups would have stories. And those would be social stories. And that's where we get social history. So history, a social history of ordinary people and their lives. Then we also have, because I'm a, a political scientist first, I guess, and not, I don't have a graduate degree, but my first area of studies was political science. We also have political stories, and our political world is divided into states, nation states. So we have national stories stories of our nation. So that's another kind of story we have. Um, and in all those stories, in history as a general field, we make choices and we create interpretations. So we have to decide, what are we going to talk about? What facts and details are we going to highlight? Anytime you tell a story, how many of you here tell stories? <laughs> and so you know, right, how challenging, you're like, what should I start with? What should I say first? Or sometimes it just happens organically, and you don't even think about the fact that you're making decisions about the story. But every time you make a choice or you create an interpretation, that is a political act. You're shaping something when you do that. So. That's how the history, the storytelling, and the politics connect. So the other area where I, that I teach in is women's studies. So in the field of women's studies, which is fairly new, it's only been around since the early 70s. It rose out of a, a period of activism and feminism that we sometimes call the second wave. And it became an academic field of study. And in women's studies, I always tell my students what we do is we put on our gender analysis glasses. So I'm putting on my glasses that are going to allow me to analyze the world from a gender perspective and bring that piece. Um, it's interdisciplinary. So in women's studies, oh hi Kelsey, sorry. Anywhere. Yeah. Um, in women's studies, we um, we use all the disciplines, the disciplines come together, and we look at the, the, we bring women into the story of the human experience. That's what women's studies as a discipline did. And that's where, you see in my talk, I, talk, I say I'm going to talk about insider and outsider strategies. So in some ways, that is where that debate it crystallizes there because there was a debate about should we have a separate women's studies department or should we just put lots of women in all the other departments, right? And so there's a dilemma and a debate there that, that happened at that time. And in fact, we did have a women's studies 
departments at various campuses. We had that developing as a field, studying all kinds of things, including the history of women. And the final field where I, like I said, my first field of study was political science, although it took me a long time to make up my mind. English, political science, English. Anyway, I went with political science. And politics, I tell my classes in the introductory courses, is the study of who gets what, when, and how. And that's not my own original quote. That's some famous political scientist, American political scientist quote. It's about power. And it's about who, you know, who's getting what in the society. So it's a social science. That's a social science. So you might ask me, why does this, why is your talk the politics of women's history instead of the history of women's politics? So I'm going to flip it now, and I'll do a quick review of the history of women's politics, which a lot of you already know. So if I'm, should I skip it? No, no. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, typically, the story we tell is a story of progress in terms of women's politics. So, we typically tell a story of women who the the legacy we have from the British common law is that Brit women were property. And because we emerged as a British colony, and prior to that, we were a French colony, and there are some differences there in the legal status of women, but when we became a British colony, obviously, we inherited the British system of common law. And under that law, women were property. They were the property of their husbands, and then they were passed on to their, or sorry, the property of their fathers, and then they were passed on to their husbands. That's why the bride is given away. Because dad is taking his property and he's conferring it on another male. So that kind of gives you the, the legal framework of the status of women in colonial Canada. So we talk about women's activism and a gradual journey where women became having gained the legal status we have now. So the person's case would be an example. Another example would be women getting the right to vote federally in 1918. So we call that early feminist activism that happened in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, first wave, that's an analogy that's been very commonly in use, we call that first wave feminism. And women made some gains in terms of their legal status during that period. Got the right to vote, became legal persons, started to be permitted into higher education programs in medicine and law and other fields where they had previously been denied. Um, served on the Senate, became elected to governments, all of that. Uh, we, then we talk about, uh, now, we tend to tell this story of marvelous progress because we're sort of taking women as a single entity. But when we start to examine women and break that category apart, we see a completely different story for First Nations women in Canada. So the period I'm talking about, the late 19th, early 20th century, is a period where for First Nations women in Canada, their status, their living standards, and their human rights are gradually being eroded to the point of near decimation. So right around 1929, when women who are not status Indians under the Indian Act are becoming legal persons, First Nations women are at an incredibly low place in their history, where they are, their, their, their um, cultural practices like the potlatch and the sun dance have been banned. They're not permitted to vote in any election of any kind, including their own banned councils that were established under the Indian Act for their own local governments. So that's a very different story. We have a story of woo, onward and upward, but we also have a parallel story of downward. So. That's again a, a, an issue of how the history of women in Canada becomes political, in what we choose to emphasize and interpret and what we choose to tell. So uh, then we have what we typically, this again, an analogy that came out of the United States and Britain. So it's a, it's a North American, it's a Western concept of a second wave of activism. 
And again, by choosing to focus on these waves, we, we kind of overlook all the, all the stuff that was happening in between waves. So um, women were, were working. Women were increasingly in the paid workforce. In the, first, in the First World War, single women. The Second World War, married women. So we kind of overlook a lot of things when we use the wave analogy. But it simplifies the story. So the second wave was the late 60s, early 70s. And this is the image that many people have when they go, well, I'm not a feminist. I believe in equality. But the new F word, the stereotypes of, you know, bra burning and Birkenstock wearing. And by the way, Birkenstocks are so in now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the second wave focused on different projects. The same projects were going on about women's legal equality, but the emphasis became more on women's reproductive rights, women's access to birth control information, birth control itself, access to abortion. Also highlighting issues of violence against women. So these are social stories. They're personal, they're social, and they're political. So that's the personal is the political was a big slogan of radical feminism in this period, um, shining the light on domestic violence. That was another main focus of that era. Um, so, and, an, and another third major focus of that era was childcare. So what do women do? They have many small children. They want them to be safely cared for in an affordable way so that they can work and they can, they can feed their families because the idea that there was always a man making money was a myth. That was never a given for women in Canada. Many women had that, of course, but many other women were alone for whatever reason with their children. And so another main issue identified in the second wave was childcare. Okay, so <clears throat> um, a, a highlight of that period <coughs> was that in 1967, a royal commission was established. Royal commission into the status of women. And it traveled the country, it talked to women's groups, talked to women, and it came out with recommendations in 1970. So that was seen as another peak year. 1969, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the father of Justin, um, modernized a lot of laws around divorce, contraception, uh, sexuality, so divorce became easier, it was no longer a crime to be homosexual, um, and uh, birth control became widely available, and abortion also became legal at that time if you, if it was approved by a panel of doctors. So there was, there were other sort of markers of progress for women on different fronts in the second wave. So then what? Uh, that's the sort of his, a very, very general history. So now we have the question, what does success look like for women politically? And I'm, uh, I'm uh, referencing a really good article in this book, Women, Politics, and Public Policy, Political Struggles of Canadian Women by Jaquetta Newman and Linda A. White. One of their chapters is the practical realities of women in politics. So they talk about um, success to them is when women are making policy, when women are involved in making government policy, and when women attain their goals. And of course that's tough because there's so many women and so many goals, right? So those are two markers that they have. And then they also talk about how women's, how activists, feminist activists have gone about this. And they identify inside strategies and outside strategies. So what would inside strategies look like? What do you think would be inside or insider strategies for women seeking gains for women in Canada? What would be some things they might do? Get together. Work together? Get together. Get together, yes. One of the things Justin's wife is doing is keeping current on the data and having it just at her fingertips. Yeah, being really, really super well informed. Yeah. 
Uh, what about in terms of institutions? How would women work, use inside strategies to, to be influential from the inside? Get jobs in government. Get jobs in government. Like we're gonna, we're gonna highlight June here. <laughs> who did exactly that, who did exactly make policy inside government. Chris? Uh, working inside unions for maternity leave? Sure. Like Absolutely. Working inside unions, advocating for better collective agreements, getting rights for women like maternity leaves, having uh, lobbying the federal government to include unpaid work at home in the census. That was another major accomplishment in 2000, no, 1996 is when that question first appeared. What do you do for work that you don't get paid for? And that was a feminist project to get that question on there. Um, anything else? Okay, so insider strategies are generally strategies where you work with the state. So you try to get on the Senate. You try to work in government departments. You try to increase the number of women in Parliament. You run for school board. You run for municipal council. You um, participate in the Royal Commission on the Status of Women. Uh, you, yeah, you know, you basically try to get into the system and in large enough numbers that you'll make a difference. What would an outsider strategy look like? Yes. Maybe some form of protest. Right. Like yesterday in Iceland, women left work 83% early. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect, perfect example. Okay. Yeah. Perfect example. Women in Iceland walking off the job. What was it? 14% early yeah. to, to signify, you know, their lesser pay. So when we think of protest, that's an outsider strategy. So in the first wave, we had Nellie McClung doing a mock parliament where she said men shouldn't have the vote, you know, their brains, they just can't handle it. And if they're voting, we can't have them out doing yard work. And she basically put on a performance to get attention. In the second wave, an outsider strategy was the abortion caravan. So women in Vancouver, women from all over Canada organized in Vancouver. They started a cross-country journey to Ottawa and they basically harassed Pierre Elliott Trudeau and said, why do we have such limitations on our access to this reproductive right? So that outsider strategies look like making some noise and getting focus and attention to further your goals. And we've had those kinds of actions all the time, not only during waves. So one of my little display items here is from the publication, this is a 2004 publication of a, a publication called Redwire. And I just came across this in our college library. And the theme is decolonize your mind. I love this. There's great stuff in here. One of the articles is Warrior Women, the Takeover of Department of Indian Affairs Offices, Vancouver, July 1981. So women, grassroots and First Nations women, did a sit-in at the DIA office, it was, as it was then called, in Vancouver, saying, why are there no Native people in these jobs? Why don't we have what we need on our reserves? Why don't we have water? Why don't we have employment? You know, they, they brought the issue home in a very direct, in-your-face kind of way. And my First Nation students are always sort of surprised and excited by this. Because very often when we tell that story of progress and feminist activism, they're like, I don't relate to that. I don't know. That's not my story. I don't identify based on my gender they sometimes have said. I, may, I identify based on my people and the issues that my people are confronting. So um, there's this kind of outsider stuff has a long, uh, long storied history. So, um, what, so what happened after the second wave? Okay, so I call this the year I finished high school, 1980. That was the year Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher were elected as the President of the U.S. and the Prime Minister of Britain, respectively. And it was the start of an ideological wave called neoliberalism. 
because countries were in recession. And the feeling was where the state has become too big. So as I'm leaving high school, there's this great, you know, this 1970s period and this great legacy of activism and things that have been achieved. And there's a, a department called Status of Women Canada. And women have, have gone inside. But programs, so social programs, including funding for women's programs, start to be progressively cut and, and scaled back and pulled back. Um, and there's a backlash against feminism because people are saying, well, what you, you've got what you wanted. You can do anything. You can do anything a man can do. So just, you know, and you're mean to men anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of talk starts to emerge and women have become hesitant about identifying as a feminist. And at the same time, um, this, this idea of a single category of womanhood starts to break down during the 80s. Because women are saying, well, like my students, it's not that I'm a woman, it's that I'm First Nations. Or it's not that I'm a woman, it's that I'm a woman with a disability. Or it's not that I'm a woman, it's that I'm an immigrant woman. And how can you speak for me when you aren't an immigrant woman? Or you aren't, a, you know, that whole identity politics is what that was called, that whole debate about what is a woman anyway, whose story are we telling, all those questions started to come up. Uh, meanwhile, First Nations women still are persons under the Indian Act, and they lose their status as a First Nations person if they marry a non-First Nations man. And by the way, they've only been able to vote federally since 1960, and they've only been able to vote for their band council members since 1951. So you see, again, a parallel and a different story. Um, okay. Here I finish high school. What up, now 1981 is when those women occupy that office. So we'll skip ahead a few years. And this year is the year I call the year I had my first baby. Because I'm doing the whole personal is political piece. And I'm inserting myself rather narcissistically into the story, right? So the year I had my first baby. I had met Char because we were we'd hung hang out at the women's center, and so she'll remember with me that already earlier, going back to 1990, women's center, women's organizational funding was getting chop, 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 and the base funding that's needed to operate and run a resource center and help women and act and advocate and do activist was getting clawed back in favor of just project. Just think of a project and just do things based on projects. So by the time I had my first baby, the Status of Women Canada funding criteria shifted away, and I've got this out of here, shifted away from advocacy, so advocating for women's rights, equity, advancement, to service provision. So the, the was more about having people come in and ask you to, you know, how can I, prepare a resume and how can I find childcare and kind of more of a service provision focus, at least officially. Um, and guess what happened in 1998? The federal government started Women's History Month. So let's go now, let's go to Women's History Month, previous themes. So this is this one, now let's go to previous themes. So here's where it starts. Canadian women making an impact. Um, so there's always the question, we're going to look through the themes now, and the themes are going to illustrate how women's history becomes capital P political in Canada. Um, so in some, actually what's happened is, um, government support for women's programs and advocacy has has declined and Women's History Month is created. So what's the implicit assumption there? We've reached it. Throw them a ball. We're done. <laughs> right? we've, we've reached it where it's all history now. 
We don't need to keep working on it because it's history. So history becomes politicized. So let's walk through the years. So this is just starting out making an impact. So we have a liberal, a federal liberal government here, the Liberal Party of Canada, Jean Chrétien, making an impact. 1999, Francophone women. And, in, not, and I'm not at all denigrating any of these things. These are all important things. But I'm just interested in what the themes and the choice of themes tell us. So, and what, and what they might suggest of which political party is in power. So Francophone women, that's a no-brainer for the Liberal Party of Canada. The Liberal Party of Canada, we have a tradition in Canada of alternating Prime Ministers, a Quebec Prime Minister, a Western Prime Minister, a Quebec Prime Minister, a Western, wanting to reflect what, what we our two solitudes, as it has sometimes been called, very much part of the story of Canada as having two founding nations, which is now very much challenged, obviously. So Francophone women, okay. We get to 2000, and we have making history, building futures. Okay, again, a general theme. Women of the 20th, oh, women of the 20th century, yeah. So this was a focus on the year 1900 to the year 2000 because it's a new millennium. So they're choosing that theme because it's been a hundred years. Then we get to volunteers. Praise of Canadian women volunteers because, so you see how these themes, they, they're always connected to something else happening politically, globally, or otherwise. Uh, this was the United Nations Year of Volunteers. And by the way, 1975 was the United Nations Year of the Woman. So I remember that as a 12 year old. All these signs. Um, but in school, I was still reading all books by men Martian Chronicles, uh, Separate Peace, Lord of the Flies, Animal Farm. You know, I remember in grade 11, I found uh, Margaret Atwood's The Edible Woman, and I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> or uh, Margaret Lawrence, The Stone Angel. I was like, but I wasn't getting that in school. So, um, here we are, women and women as volunteers, because that's what the UN is doing. Next one, women in sports, champions forever, because just think of the number of medals brought home by our female athletes from the 20, 2002 Olympic Winter Games in Salt Lake City. So part of the purpose of this, what's happening here? What's part of the purpose of, of Women's History Month from a, a political level? Everything is fine. Everything is fine. And actually what we're doing is we're telling a national story. We're nation building here. This is nation building. And this site, and I'm again, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But as a political scientist, what's also happening is a thing called political socialization. So we're teaching about what is Canada, what's our story, who are we as Canadians, and we're wanting young people to know about women in Canada. It's great what women have done, but the themes are interesting. So here's sport. 2003 is when Paul Martin comes into power, so still a liberal government. What do you mean women couldn't vote? Okay, so uh, I, and I, this, is, this pretty much tells it right here, the, the purpose of the month. Uh, sometimes these liberties and rights that our foremothers struggle to win are taken for granted. Women's History Month is an ideal opportunity to encourage young Canadians to look back at the past and understand how far we've come. So, political socialization, like teaching people about their nation, their history. But with the assumption that, yeah, we, didn't we do great? We're done now. Then we carry on with that through Women Are Persons. 2004, 75th anniversary of the person's case, which I've already talked about. 2005, women in war. Interesting, remember this. Now this is a liberal government. Contributions and consequences. So 60th anniversary of VE Day and VJ Day. Year of the veteran government of Canada. Women of Canada have made countless contributions to both the war effort and the peace movement. So that's interesting. Contributions and consequences, war and peace. 
Now let's go to 2006. So 2006 is the year Stephen Harper is first elected with the Conservative government. The theme is Aboriginal Women, the Journey Forward. Now, I don't know what the timing is of creating and planning these things, but to me this looks very much like a liberal, federal liberal theme. Partly because it references the United Nations and a number of royal commissions on Aboriginal people that were all conducted by liberal governments. So here for the first time we're looking at Aboriginal women. Maybe this was created after Harper was elected, maybe it was created before, or maybe Harper was taking small steps to change the political culture in Canada and he decided to leave this alone. So now let's look at 2007. We have Celebrating Immigrant Women because it's an anniversary of citizenship in Canada. So that's looking at immigrant women, that's great, okay. Now 2008, Stephen Harper wins his second uh, term, a minority government. Women in the lead. So we have women in the lead. So we have a slightly different emphasis now. Uh, women and girls of all ages, extraordinary achievements. And 2009 is women in the lead, winter sports. We're back to sports. But we already did sports. <laughs> Why are we doing sports again? The Olympics. Because we have another Olympics and they're hosted in Vancouver. So, yay, it's great, girls can compete individually and on teams, they're equal to men, excellent. 2010, we have women in business. Okay, so here's the 20, now this is completely what you'd expect from a conservative government that is very, has an ideology that's very individually based. It's about individual achievement. So here's the poster from 2010. And here's our first female Prime Minister, by the way, Kim Campbell. She was a progressive conservative. And she started the bureaucratic changes to women's programs that kind of downsized them a bit. So here we have our 2010 poster. Women are climbing up, climbing up the ladder of business, climbing up the corporate ladder. So it's just it's just a different emphasis. Is that an accurate graph, or is, the, is that is that I think it's, or is I that going to be a no or a or I think it's just a uh, representation a of a graph. There's no, there's no, there's no, there's no there's axis no. labels or quantities. No, it's no, pictorial. No, no. No, no. And and also, by the way, we at the college we would we would commemorate Women's History Month sometimes with displays. So that year we had that poster, and this was usually staff in the library that would do this. We'd sort of um, do this collaboratively. So we had pictures of people like Heather from Indigo, Heather, forget her last name, but women who had reached the higher levels of business as CEOs and entrepreneurs. So we, we highlighted that. So not at, now, read this. Acknowledge the full range of women's contribution to our economic growth. So there's a new emphasis and focus. Fair enough, right? But I'm just saying, it reflects the change. Next one, 2011. We're back to war again in the military. But it's a little bit of a different emphasis. So this is Women in Canadian Military Forces, a proud legacy. There is mention of Oh, yeah, there is mention of peacekeepers, but there's less of an emphasis on peace and um, consequences. There's a slightly, there's a more of an emphasis on, I would say, I mean, then this is my read, that this is more a part of the general Harper militarization, uh, uh, favoring a monarchistic, militarized kind of Canada. A different kind of Canada is being described here. Because again, well, we've done war already. Why are we doing war again? Well, we're now we're sort of taking a conservative take on Canada's military history here. Again, recognizing women's incredible contributions, but a little bit more of an emphasis on the military, and less of an emphasis on war and peace. 
So 2012. Okay, this is because it be, the UN declared uh, the 2012 was the first year we had the International Day of the Girl because of what happened to Malala in um, Pakistan, partly. And also because there was a recognition that globally, if you lift women, you're going to lift societies. So again, this is why we picked this theme. And we mention that Canada led the international community in establishing this day. So there's a political. Every government will spin this to make itself look awesome. Uh, 2013, again, we have leadership. And now we're emphasizing science, technology, and trades, natural resources, and construction. So again, you've heard those things talked about quite a bit in recent years. 2014, what do we have? Does that look familiar? Mm -hmm. Business, again. Now, I'm not in business, right? So I'm also reflecting my own bias. But I'm thinking, why have we had business, sports, and war twice? Are there no other themes we could think of? Okay, so 2015 is, again, a general one, celebrating Canadian women. So let's jump to the present day one now. Uh, <coughs> oh, and I should also mention that in 26, 2006, uh, Harper took equity out of the mandate of Status of Women Canada. He removed the reference to women achieving equity. So women's role was really narrowly defined as an economic one, economic contributor, uh, individual leadership, and so on. Um, so here we are now. Oh, I, I'm running out of time. So much to say. Anyway, <laughs> before we go to this year's theme of, of the this present theme, what ha else happened during the Harper years? So what else happened during the Harper years? The assumption that women had achieved what they needed to achieve intensified. But at the, at the same time, also, there was an apology made. Harper made an apology about residential schools. There was a settlement agreement. The uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission was launched. So a new focus, again, on in indigenous women and peoples and what their experiences had been being colonized in a country we call Canada. Um, but when it came to missing and murdered indigenous women, when Stephen Harper was asked in an interview about having an inquiry into that, his answer was, it's not on our radar. That was a down moment for me. Not on our radar. So, um, Outside strategies, again, came into play. And the main outside strategy I'm thinking of was now sparked and led by ordinary indigenous women. Do you know what I'm thinking of? Idle No More. I'm thinking of Idle No More. So here, again, you have an outside strategy using social media, angry with things happening in government, women taking to the streets, Chief Spence doing a hunger strike on Victoria Island, right across from the Parliament buildings, outsider strategies. So uh, we have a new government now, about a year old, and their theme we need to see Which one? Uh, the first, the f seller, no, not this one, but status of women, Women's History Month. There we go. This is, this is the current theme for this year because of her. And so the question now, now becomes, well, great, now we have a liberal government. Are we there yet? He, Justin Trudeau had a cabinet of 50, 50, 50, 50 percent women, 50 percent men. And we was asked about that. He's, why? He said, because it's 2016, 15, or, well, that was last year, because it's 2015. So it looks like, based on an insider thing, that, okay, 50-50, plus we have 
women in high-ranking political positions. We have Jody Wilson-Raybould, who is the Minister of Justice. We have um, Melanie Mark, who's the first First Nations woman elected to the BC legislature. So, and we have an inquiry on missing and murdered Aboriginal women that's now underway. So those insider activities are still happening, but we still need, I feel, outsider activities. And the outsider activities, the group that I see that's very, very active is the Native Women's Association of Canada. They get about one quarter of their funding from, it's just a quick check I did, from um, Aboriginal and Northern Affairs. So not from Status of Women, but from Aboriginal and Northern Affairs. And they're an incredible organization that's doing the outside, keeping up the outside pressure. Cindy Blackstock is another person who's spoken about the lives of Aboriginal children and the, the need to address um, the difference, the big disparity in their lives versus non-Aboriginal children's lives. So um, we still need that outside pressure. Just some stats from the 2006 census. Now, why don't I have more recent stats? Because there was no long-form census in 2011. So uh, one in nine Canadian women live in poverty. Women still earn 70% on the male dollar for full-time work. Unpaid caregiving in the home is still done primarily by women. Violence in the home is still an ongoing issue. We still don't have a national daycare strategy. And we still have limited access to abortion depending on where you live. So in my view, we're not there yet. And um, although we have a different government now that, uh, that is more friendly to women and is more, f and Justin Trudeau has said, I'm a feminist and has spoken internationally about it, we still have work to do. And a lot of those most effective strategies are outsider strategies. So um, what I want you to think about, and we'll, we'll get some ideas now, is what is your dream theme of the future for Women's History Month? If you could invent a theme, what would it be? So think about that and we'll, I'll get some. What, what, what could be some future themes of Women's <coughs> History Month? I think respect is a very important part. Respect. Okay, so some kind of a theme around respect, giving women respect. And outreach. And outreach, okay, so empathy. women reaching out, empathy. <coughs> Any other ideas for future themes? Um, Amy? Maybe ecofeminism mm -hmm. or social justice. Ecofeminism, social justice, Shark? In 1990, Nova Scotia is working with the Elizabeth Fry Society, which works with women and so they were just in the provincial jail system there's not even a dozen women um, um, residing in um, an area of the larger men's provincial and they could not have any programs whereas the men had you know it was practically another community college there to learn skills yeah and so yeah the women couldn't have anything because there were not enough of them that's just no there's only there's only a few we're not going to do anything and I was as a volunteer I was working with the national um, um, daycare coalition or whatever and uh, Paul Martin said he couldn't do anything about it because there was too many of them <laughs> and suggested bake sales so <laughs> we put out cards to bake 475 billion cookies right, whatever, with the right. recipe on it yeah so volunteer women right <laughs> yes so maybe the theme would be just the right amount yeah, yeah. of women to get served to get service <laughs> not too few not too many Ignore. Just the right amount. Just the right amount. Yeah. Yeah. A politically subversive theme. Thank you. And and or other themes, women in ecofeminism, women at women at the forefront, women defending the environment. I don't know. Other ideas. Yes. I go with the integral human and and have it all about men and women and both sides of each of us. Mm-hmm. Okay. How far have we come in that direction? Sure. Yeah. So the gendered the gendered body or the gendered whatever, or how are the integrated human, however. Doesn't that destroy the whole idea of, of feminism and focus on women if you make it integrated? We're supposed to be talking about women's problems. Why, 
why bring in another gender just to complicate? I mean, this, I this is always a problem, isn't it? And this is why feminism has, has vanished virtually, because we want to be so inclusive, and men feel the same way too, and men are suffering the same thing too, and you know, I, so I, I, I heard, yeah, I, I personally, don't know. I wouldn't I don't call know. it a man. No, no, I mean, this is a real debate. This is an absolute real debate in the theory, in feminist theories. Does, does the question then become something related to what the goal is? Like, if my intention is to clearly work through resistance, I'm just going to pick Phil because I know him. So whatever it is, it could be about parking spaces. So uh -huh. if we go to have this conversation, there's not much charge on our parking spaces. So it's probably going to be pretty short, and we don't even have one on our campus. But so then if I go on a supercharged conversation, or he does, and we're trying to have that, that's a whole different thing. So none of these, as we're talking about, what is it they're really addressing at the most core level? Mm -hmm. And how do we keep bouncing up to the superficial? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Women on the hockey team, did right. you see those mm -hmm. ladies right. doing the soccer mm -hmm. right. in Brazil? Right. If we don't get to the core of where is humanity going and make it an agenda that's important and intentional for everyone, mm -hmm then how do we ever get through the resistance? So if I go to him going, you're in my parking space again, when we don't even have parking spaces that are defined. Mm -hmm. So getting, mm -hmm. to, getting to where we're going with an intentionality that's deep enough to take everyone mm -hmm. seems to be getting increasingly important, especially when you're talking about how easily it can become that resistance and some little phrase pops up like there's not enough of it. Uh, there's too yeah, many of them yeah, or yeah. whatever it is. Well, if, if the person speaking had that depth of intentionality, that right. wouldn't still be going on, and yet it is every day. The debates, oh God, if I see any more of that, just how, <laughs> right. This, right. how huge the schism is. is. Still it is, oh. yeah, yeah. And I, I hear you saying a couple of things, one of which is the superficiality of the themes. Mm -hmm. That's to begin really nice. with. Yeah. And that's why I say it's a political project, right? And that's why I titled this politics of women's history, because this is an example of women's history being taken and, and made political, but, but another, also how can it not be? Because it is about politics and it is about advancement. About and history. And if it, it, the past, we're not going to be measuring what we still have to do because that's the future. Yes, So totally. By talking about history, you're pretty much necessarily talking about accomplishment. Totally. You have to talk about where we've been to have us. Like one of my idea seems to be the future, but that's not, I don't know if you could put that right. in women's history. Right. right. The future. Yeah. What do we still yeah. have to do? You could almost say the whole Women's History Month is a diversionary. Yeah. <laughs> 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 what should the theme be? Right? And so, yeah, I try to get, you know, we talk. My students do have to know what happened because they, the young student, they don't know. They don't realize that now is, you know, but, but this whole discussion about uh, how do we move forward, how do we engage everyone on a very deep level, and really what's become into the big discussion thing has been gender identity, trans people, and all of those things. And now the emphasis is less on men and women, and that discussion, that debate hasn't gone away, but it's about masculinities and femininities. You know, how do we culturally define masculinities and it what how do we what is it about these ideas that shape our society and that shape individuals in our society that's kind of the cutting edge of the theoretical prism yeah so any other questions or comments yes maybe i'll just follow up on the on the on the uh, alternative strategies articulated by president and mary in there yeah. and that is as an academic administrator, I'm very concerned about recruitment and trying to reach out to community needs. Right. And if I think about this topic, it should be mostly men in the room. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would be nice to recruit people into programs that allow them to explore this more. Mm -hmm. But the term women's studies courses or mm -hmm. women's mm -hmm. studies departments, mm -hmm. I think, does deter men from taking part in them. So is there, in fact, a need to transition to gender studies as a discipline? Well, aren't there some universities that offer gender studies? Yes. Do you call it women's studies anymore? Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, I think I think even within UNBC, is it is it still women's studies or has it gone to gender it's studies? Women's studies. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and that is that that is the debate that you you want to make everyone engage on a deep level and not kind of ghettoize it. You know, women only here and then be preaching to the converted, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But that's an assumption in and of itself, because even a room full of women are going to have all kinds of different perspectives. Versus um, engaging everyone and making this, as Verna said really eloquently, I think, you know, getting everyone on a deep level to tap into. How does this affect you? That's it. That's it. I, I mean, I've had men in my classes, but I've never had more than two men in a women's studies class. I typically have one lone male that's in a social work program that's taking it because he needs it for the social work thing. And and they always love it. They don't, you know. And I've had students saying, why aren't there more guys in here? So I don't know if repackaging it as gender studies is the answer to that at all. So any ideas, any other thoughts? I'll just I'll talk a little bit about what I brought here. I just brought a few different things. So this was sort of the women in business theme. This is how BC Book World commemorated it one year. Um, here's some historical articles of the newspapers. This one's kind of fun, a little because this is done through the arts too. So a play. Uh, this was Mama Mama Lambley. It was a play done at Heritage Park. You must, this is before your time, but we did a reprisal with did you when I was there. Yeah, yeah. Mom, Mom. Yes. And I noticed this is written by Rebecca Collard, who's now reporting from Iraq. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so there's a, an individual story. Um, women's view of the terrorist mutiny, uh, lesbian public fiction. We talked about that in History of Women in Canada. That's another topic. Um, and then just a, a variety of different things we've had at the college. We've had speakers. This one was about women's survival strategies in the depression. Um, because then I didn't really talk about the world of academe that much and what the trends are there. But uh, women of the sacred headwaters. So here's a little booklet that came out in the, with the 2005 year. So feel free to browse. Thank you.